the sky of the heart with jewels of wisdom from Swami Nityananda. Introduction. It is reported that many came to see Nityananda in a kind of window shopping, seeking maya, illusion, seeking the fulfillment of material desire instead of the highest spiritual gifts that Nityananda had to offer. On the evening of the day before his Maha Nirvana, on August 7, 1961, sometime after midnight, Nityananda said, Everyone comes here for money and only money. The more they are given, the more they seek. There is no end to their greed. When they come, they are on foot, sometimes without a proper dwelling place. And when they get the necessities, Next come comforts and luxuries, which are demanded. Then a car, and they need a house, and so on. When earlier prayers are granted in the hope that contentment would follow, and that they would then seek higher values, another demand is placed in a never-ending series of wants and desires. For centuries, Westerners have seen India as a land of magic and mystery. Western writers describe both fiery-eyed mystics performing apparent feats of magic, as well as rigorous system of scholarship in philosophy pursued with energy and precision for thousands of years. India is a land of stunning and overwhelming contrasts. But of all its extraordinary and mysterious features, one of the most amazing is that every 50 years or so, she is gifted with the presence of a great realized being, a Mahatma. Such a one is born totally pure, innately free of any attachment whatsoever to the world and to worldly things. Because of the Mahatma's total immersion in the divine and universal, the flow of energy through his or her being is remarkable. Nityananda was such a being, a Mahatma of incredible, awesome power and capacity. The presence that was Nityananda had very little to do with his body and everything to do with the great spiritual force of which his body was merely a beacon. His body was simply a sign pointing to the deep and endless well of spiritual power. And such a well does not belong to any personality. Americans do not think easily in these terms. Although we have seen many gurus in the past several decades, this being in the 1980s, it is impossible for us to really fathom who or what Nityananda was because his state of being at no point corresponds to ordinary individual experience or consciousness as Americans know it. Among the so-called gurus who have been here, only a few were great beings. Many were great showmen, and a few were charlatans. As a result, Americans question deeply both the nature of the guru and the need for one. We are unprepared for someone like Nityananda. Culturally, we have no precedence or criteria by which to classify a being whose very nature is detachment. Nityananda had no purpose in the world and no message to bring. Why he appeared is unknown to anyone. He was born to the austerity in which he lived his life. Simplicity and detachment were his essential nature, not something trained for or contemplated, a completely natural greatness. Yet detachment, this complete, 
is totally unfamiliar to us, even shocking. For example, people often brought him offerings of fruit, which by week's end might add up to tons of food. And sometimes it would rot. It was not that he was stingy or did not want to give it away. In a way, he did not even notice that it was there. He was that disinterested in external things. All the fruit and flowers and other gifts that appeared were like raindrops falling from the sky. It never occurred to him to do anything with objects that manifested around him. Most of us think that in order to pursue a spiritual life, we need something different from what we already know, a different idea, philosophy, or lifestyle. Nityananda made no such demands. He did not promote a particular lifestyle, philosophy, or perspective. He was not a teacher of any method, and he did nothing to establish an organization around him. He never gave the required programs, intensives, or workshops, or seminars, assumed by modern-day mentalities, and he never asked for money. People came to him, and he blessed them. He uplifted them. He gave them whatever they were able to take from him. It was just that simple and that free. He brought tremendous peace and betterment to the simple people. The poor and the destitute were especially drawn to his simplicity and lack of judgment. As time went on, he touched the lives of countless beings of all classes, showering miracles of healing and upliftment upon them. He sought no one's approval, recognition, or promotion for this. He lived in the jungle where people had to seek him out. Nityananda was a very simple man who dedicated his life to the presence of the divine and who lived each day as a beacon of that presence. To approach Nityananda, we must suspend all judgment. His words are profound, and the subject is nothing less than the essence of life itself. We often think in terms of being blessed by a great master, But it is not the act of a self-realized being declaring, you are now blessed. It does not work like that. One who is self-realized is no different from the absolute. He has realized God and is God in form. It is the act of merely being in the presence of such a being that bestows grace. Proximity to a Mahatma is a transforming experience, giving each one exactly what he or she is capable of handling or receiving. This is why we read that Nityananda's presence was considered divine presence. For in the most literal and real sense, one was standing in the presence of God. This presence naturally produces miracles in the lives of all one touches and It continues to this very day.